As the U.S. joined World War I, their inexperienced troops and lack of military doctrine gave Allied commanders scarce hope that they would turn the tide of a war in which Britain and France were barely holding the line against a relentless German offensive, and Russia had signed a separate peace treaty with the Central Powers. Then, in the spring of 1918, the U.S. military's first ever modern division was swiftly organized to conduct the first American assault in the area in an attempt to capture Contigny. Despite the minor strategic importance of the French village, the stakes could not be higher. If the first division failed at Contigny, the consequences on the morale of the Allied forces would be unmeasurable, the Germans would prove that the U.S. troops were inferior, and the world would perceive the U.S. as not being ready to enter the big leagues of the world's superpowers. As the soldiers from the 1st Division prepared for the unprecedented assault against the most potent military power in the world, they marveled at the sight of modern warfare operations, tanks and aircraft flying over them in a coordinated orchestra of destruction. Little did they know that their actions that day would define the future of U.S. military warfare and set the stage for the end of the war. A Need for Soldiers From 1914 to the last months of 1917, the U.S. had attempted to stay out of the European conflict. But as the Germans resumed unrestricted submarine warfare and tried to ally with Mexico to invade the U.S., President Woodrow Wilson decided that they couldn't remain neutral anymore. Wilson then petitioned Congress to declare war on Germany, knowing full well that the U.S. was not ready for such a daunting task. Still, the Germans had revealed their plans to bring the war to North America, and the recent exit of Russia from the conflict meant that Germany would soon be able to concentrate even more military power on the already depleted French and German troops defending the Western Front. After the U.S. entered the conflict, a special delegation of British and French diplomats met with President Wilson and asked him to send American troops to France immediately. Wilson responded by promising that he would have a division in France by June. The delegation was ecstatic, but there was a significant issue with Wilson's promise. The U.S. didn't have a single active division. By then, the U.S. only had very few regiments, and most of them were at the U.S.-Mexico border looking for Pancho Villa. The Allies knew that the U.S. had no military doctrine and a limited structure, and believed that if they attempted to define a major independent army overnight, it could turn into a complete disaster that would not alleviate their current distress. Furthermore, France and Britain practically begged the U.S. authorities not to organize their troops into an independent army. Instead, the Allies asked for American troops to join the military structures of their already experienced armies and serve as replacement soldiers for their fallen or depleted troops. Suffice to say that the U.S. was not keen on sending American men to fight under foreign command, and they denied this proposal. The U.S. was joining the war on its own terms, and if that meant hastily defining what a U.S. division needed to be while on their way to France, so be it. The First Division The name of the 1st Division was chosen because President Wilson promised to the British and the French that it would be the first permanently established modern division of the U.S. Army. In past conflicts, U.S. commanders had used the term division, but they didn't mean much, as they often referred to regiment-sized forces and didn't have a specific or replicable structure. The regiments that would give shape to the 1st Division were mainly serving in the U.S.-Mexico border at the time, and they were then drafted to the East Coast to be shipped to Europe. The inexperienced soldiers went from hunting down small groups of outlaws in the Mexican desert to facing off against the most powerful and experienced army in the world. General John J. Pershing oversaw the expeditionary force sent to France, and the government also tasked him with organizing the regiments he had taken into an operating division. However, the dire situation on the Western Front meant that Pershing had to do it as he and the troops were already on the ship crossing the Atlantic. The general then came up with a square division arrangement, meaning that the 1st U.S. Division would have the main body of two infantry brigades composed of two infantry regiments each. In contrast to Britain and France, the U.S. had the manpower to form square divisions. European nations preferred smaller divisions to cover more ground and adequately protect their extensive trenches, but the U.S. military planned to go on the offensive right away. Besides the two infantry brigades, the original iteration of the 1st Division included one engineer battalion, one signal battalion, one trench mortar battery, one field artillery brigade of three field artillery regiments, one air squadron, and an entire division train. In total, 18,919 officers and enlisted men formed the division. As the men arrived in Europe, 
the first order of business was to parade in. The French army desperately needed a morale boost and the urgent support of the Americans to continue fighting. As the Allies sent the 1st Division into the front line, they spent several months conducting defensive operations and helping the Allies hold back German advances. Meanwhile, more and more U.S. troops arrived in France, and by 1918, the U.S. had over 40 divisions ready to take the battle to the Germans. The Battle General Pershing soon assumed command of all the American troops in the Western Front, and when the time came for the U.S. to break off the prolonged trench stalemate, Pershing chose the 1st Division as the unit fit for the task. The Americans were to make their offensive debut by capturing the farming village of Cantigny, which had recently been captured by the Germans, creating a bulge in the front line that the U.S. needed to push back. Beyond representing a German advance, the village had no strategic value, but it was considered a fitting location to attempt their first offensive. Unfortunately for the American advance, the village was located on high ground surrounded by forests, making it an excellent observation post for German artillery. The stakes were through the roof, as Pershing knew that Cantigny could either start a massive snowball effect of American victories, or it could be a significant disaster that demoralized the already depleted Allies as well as the American troops. The Germans knew this too, and they were determined to foil the first American offensive at any cost. If they could propel them on the first assault, the world would see that the German army was unrelenting. On May 28, 1918, U.S. soldiers from the 1st Division charged out of the trenches following an hour-long artillery onslaught on the village. Similarly, coordinated counter-battery fire had been directed at German artillery positions, weakening their response capabilities. As the troops descended on the village, an artillery rolling barrage that advanced 110 yards every two minutes was unleashed. This was carefully designed to allow the troops to safely move behind the barrage while keeping the Germans under fire and with limited visibility. It would be the first time that U.S. troops would use modern warfare tactics and artillery in infantry and tank-coordinated strikes. Covered by the barrage, the 28th Infantry Regiment, two companies from the 18th Infantry Regiment, three machine gun companies, and a company of engineers rushed the village. They surprised the entrenched Germans as they were covered from the artillery fire. The assault was covered by the French, who provided air support, 368 heavy artillery pieces, trench mortars, tanks, and flamethrowers. The French tanks belonged to the French 5th Tank Battalion, and their primary purpose was to neutralize German machine gun positions, while the American troops neutralized the Germans in the trenches. Thanks to the significant French support, the overwhelming number of American troops, and the artillery tactics, the 1st Division advanced successfully behind the creeping artillery barrage and captured the village in less than 30 minutes. They then continued to their final objective, roughly a half kilometer beyond the town. The Counter-Strike The village's capture had been straightforward, but the defense of newly gained territory would be much more lethal than the initial assault. The first German counterattack took place at 8.30 a.m. through the right side of the new American defensive position. It was easily repelled, but German artillery then bombarded the 28th Infantry for most of the day, inflicting many casualties. At 5.10 p.m., the first large-scale German counteroffensive was launched, and the American troops had to reorganize by sending a company of the 1st Battalion of the 26th Infantry Regiment, commanded by Major Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., to strengthen a weak spot in the American line. Another counterattack at 6.40 p.m. was barely resisted by a combination of artillery and infantry defense fire, and brutal German attacks would continue for the next two days. Still, the American soldiers held their positions until the Germans withdrew from the village. The village's defense cost the Americans about 1,600 casualties, and despite being a tactically insignificant capture, it resulted in way too many losses. Still, the victory in Cantigny would turn out to be a decisive moment in U.S. military history. Not only did the U.S. prove that they had an influential military doctrine, and that they could act as a powerful independent army, but they also showed the world that the American army was a force to be reckoned with. For the rest of the war, the American troops successfully took on the offensive, leaving the trench warfare behind and taking the fight to the Germans. From then on, the 1st Division would play a key role in the U.S. military success for decades to come. Thank you for watching my video. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below, 
And don't forget to subscribe to all of our Dark Documentaries channels for more exciting history-inspired stories. Also, hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. And stay tuned for more.